fatally easy to start a war, especially if you think it will be a short and simple affair. But let loose the dogs of war and things can go horribly wrong. That's what happened to the Emperor Napoleon in 1807. He decided to invade Portugal, which was virtually the last nation on the European mainland still trading with the real enemy, Britain. And it should have been a pushover. Spain was France's ally. The Portuguese army was scarcely formidable, and Portugal itself was in political turmoil. All the French army had to do was cross that bridge behind me, march into Portugal, and it should all have been over. It should have been a short summer's campaign. Instead, it turned into the longest, most vicious conflict of the Napoleonic era. We call it the Peninsula War. <laughs> Think of that war as a great British triumph, an heroic saga of red coats and green jackets, of the brown bess and the Baker rifle. It's the era of Hornblower and Jack Aubrey. It is indeed the war that Richard Sharp fought. Yet what Sharp does, what I do, is to perpetuate a myth. The myth is that we won the war. We didn't. The Portuguese and the Spanish people turn Napoleon's occupation of their countries into a nightmare. The Spanish ulcer, the French called it. That Spanish affair Napoleon said on St. Helena is what killed him. We British did help, but at first that help was hesitant and ineffective. Meanwhile, at Madrid, the real horrors are just beginning. to the adventures of Richard Sharp, Bernard Cornwell's great fictional hero. This, though, is the story behind the swashbuckling of the romance. This is the true story of the Peninsula War, Sharp's War. defeated all the major continental European powers. He was the virtual master of Europe. By 1807, Napoleon had defeated Austria, Prussia, and Russia. Now, for all intents and purposes, he either controlled or had influence over the entire Eurasian landmass. There was only one major power who now stood out against him. That was Britain. And Napoleon knew that an invasion of Britain was simply not going to be possible. At least, it was not going to be possible for many years. So he decided on an alternative policy, which was the continental system. The continental system was a, a system by which Britain would be blockaded into submission. The ports of Europe would be closed to British trade. The one nation which actually stood out against the continental system was Portugal. Portugal had to be brought to heel. According to Napoleon, Britain was a nation of shopkeepers, and prior to the beginning of the Peninsular War, its only, if you like, major customer was Portugal. In order for 
Napoleon to enforce his continental system by which he hoped to bar Britain trading with Europe, he needed to close down the port of Lisbon. It was quite as simple as that, uh, which is why he sent Junot to go and arrest the Portuguese royal family and to enforce his will on Portugal to close British trade to Portugal and to enforce his blockade right the way across the continental coast of Europe. In October 1807, with the cooperation of Spain, Napoleon sent an army under General Jean Andoche Junot to invade Portugal. The arduous march decimated the French army. But although they were severely weakened, they still occupied Lisbon on the 30th of November. Junot's practically bloodless and unopposed conquest of Portugal was made against the backdrop of ever-increasing political turmoil in Spain. The chief figure in Spain in 1808 was the royal favourite, Manuel de Godoy. One of the things he wanted to do was to strengthen Spain's military power so she could break away from France and stand on her own two feet. But the very fact that he was a reformer made him unpopular and a faction therefore formed against Godoy and seized upon the heir to the throne, Prince Ferdinand, the future Ferdinand VII, as a figurehead. Prince Ferdinand wasted no time in launching a smear campaign against Godoy, with the aim of making him too unpopular to remain in office. But Ferdinand needed a trump card to crush Godoy once and for all. So the prince called on the support of the emperor Napoleon. The timing was perfect, for while Spain's political game was being played out, Napoleon had been waiting for the right moment to make his own move. Dismayed by the bickering of the Spanish court, Napoleon decided to take matters into his own hands. In February 1808, he sent his troops over the Pyrenees. For Godoy, time was fast running out. Godoy now realizes that Napoleon is actually set on taking over Spain and he frantically tries to organize resistance. This, of course, is regarded with absolute horror by Prince Ferdinand and his supporters. They realize that a breach with Napoleon could very well lead to the complete overthrow of the Bourbon monarchy. They therefore organize a coup. <laughs> It finally dawned on Ferdinand that the unrest in Spain was providing the perfect conditions for a French invasion. He also realized that unless the matter was resolved quickly, the Bourbon monarchy might itself be overthrown. Godoy was arrested and imprisoned, much to the joy of the Spanish public, who were convinced by this time that he was the source of all Spain's evils. King Ferdinand, on the other hand, had been painted as a saviour who would lead Spain into a new, golden age. And so, when he arrived in Madrid in March, Ferdinand was given a rapturous reception. Meanwhile, French troops were dispatched to key Spanish provinces, and an army of nearly 120,000 men under Marshal Murat was sent supposedly to reinforce Juno in Portugal. But which, to no one's great surprise, actually occupied Madrid in March 1808. But Napoleon had gravely misjudged the Spanish people. Unlike the rest of Europe, which had easily succumbed to the Emperor's power, the French presence in Spain provoked fear, anger, and, more dangerously, an unquenchable desire for retribution. Napoleon got his first taste of what lay in store when the population of Madrid launched itself upon Marshal Murat's French garrison. This was the infamous Dos de Mayo uprising, the revolution
revolt of Madrid that began and ended in May 1808 and was brutally suppressed with the loss of more than 500 Spanish lives. The French had very light forces in Madrid. Uh, Mura had an army of 10,000 outside. But what happened is that rumors began spreading throughout Madrid that the last of the Spanish royal family were being removed to De France. And French soldiers, isolated French soldiers, began being attacked in, in the streets. <laughs> French open fire. The number of Spaniards killed. Um, the Spaniards went back to their houses. They got hold of whatever weapons they could lay their hands on and opened fire on the French. When news got out to, to Mura that there was a revolt in the city, the French entered in force. And they fought their way through the streets, gradually holding the insurgents into the center of the city, into the Huerta del Sol, and there took place a massacre. About 200 Spaniards were killed, another 300 were made prisoner, and those 300 were executed during the night. The Spanish artist Francisco Goya, in two powerful works, entitled The 2nd of May and The 3rd of May, captured the bloody scenes during the Dos de Mayo uprising. These events are still commemorated and reenacted by the people of Madrid. The whole of Spain erupted in furious rebellion, fueled by the news that Napoleon had placed his own brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne. Provinces all over the country rose to fight the French invaders, and Napoleon's armies responded in typically robust fashion. Several towns were put to the torch. In most cases, the Spanish forces that tried to fight back were no match for the French armies. There were exceptions, however. In July 1808, French forces attacking Saragossa were fought to a standstill by a mob of armed civilians. Worse still, during the same month, the French general Dupont surrendered his entire army of nearly 20,000 men to a Spanish force under General Castanus at Bailen in Andalusia. Dupont's problem is that he was retreating from Cordoba. Uh, he had a very large baggage train, which was filled with loot from, from Cordoba. And he was caught in the worst possible way that for an army to be caught. He was spread out in column, stretched over many, many miles, and, and Dupont's forces near Balen ran into a roadblock. Now, Dupont fed his troops in piecemeal to try and break this roadblock. By the late afternoon, uh, Dupont's men were short of ammunition, had not been able to break through. Spanish forces were closing in on what is near. A complete disaster for Dupont. He had no alternative but to seek an armistice. Now, what Dupont should have done was to have concentrated his forces before attacking, moved up his reserves, and in all probability he could actually have smashed through the roadblock. But we've actually got to remember that, that Dupont's forces were not first-rate. We're talking about really second or third-rate French forces here, and Dupont was the chap who actually had to carry the can for, for this disaster. <laughs> The French capitulation at Bailen was a highly significant moment. It was unheard of for an army of Napoleon's soldiers to lay down their arms in open battle. Almost at a stroke, the veneer of French invincibility was stripped away. Napoleon received the news with a combination of anger and disbelief, and left little doubt as to where he felt responsibility for the debacle lay. There has never been anything so foolish, so stupid, or so cowardly since the world began. It is perfectly clear from Dupont's own report 
that everything was the result of the most inconceivable incapacity on his part, the Emperor raged. No sooner had Spain risen in revolt than it occurred to a number of Spaniards that their obvious friend in need was Great Britain. And very quickly, a number of emissaries are sent to Britain with requests for help. When the news reaches England, there was, there was disbelief and then overwhelming joy. And, and the British government uh, very quickly makes plans uh, to send an expeditionary force and considerable aid to the Iberian Peninsula. Napoleon, of course, is in a state of complete rage about this uh, and becomes focused on the Iberian Peninsula in a way which is ultimately going to be disastrous for him. What made the Bailen campaign still more significant was the emergence of guerrilla warfare. Organized by the local authorities, bands of Spanish irregulars had harassed Dupont's communications with Madrid and unleashed a series of terrible atrocities. The effect on the Spanish is both good and bad. It increases the Spanish resolve to, to, to fight on, but also gives them a wholly exaggerated idea of their own military prowess. They believe that Dupont's army had in fact been a first-rate French army. They were soon to discover this was not the case when they came up against real first-rate French troops. Nine thousand British troops were sent to the peninsula under the command of one of Britain's most talented generals, his name was Sir Arthur Wellesley, later to become the Duke of Wellington, and it was he who would become the dominant figure of the entire Peninsula War. Well, Sir Arthur Wellesley was very much a political soldier. He was still under Secretary of State for Ireland when he was appointed to command in the Peninsula. He'd seen action in the Low Countries in the 1790s where, as he said, he learned not what to do, but what not to do. He served with great distinction in India and was the victor of the Battle of Assay in 1803 and was 24 years old when he was a Lieutenant Colonel. So it was, it was a swift rise to uh, his position and would become, by the end of the Peninsular War and certainly after Waterloo, one of the greatest soldiers we'd ever produced. Wellesley was a, a brilliant mathematician and also a, a, a gifted musician. Uh, he had a mind that, that operated like a computer. He could actually work out the, the, the rate of march and where, where a battalion could be within, within the next 15 or, or 20 minutes faster than, than anybody else could. His mind was just that much faster. The British army landed at Mondego Bay in Portugal, some 80 miles south of Lisbon, on the 1st of August, 1808. Two weeks later, it was in action against the French at Rolica. The Battle of Rolica was a small affair, particularly when compared to the bloodbaths to come, but it demonstrated to the French that the British army were willing and more than able to fight. Wellesley's army defeated the French in a very, very small, by later standards, a skirmish at Rolisa on the 17th of August, 1808. The French there under Delaborde, outnumbered, massively outnumbered, were easily driven from their position. This opens the way, of course, to Lisbon, where the rest of the French army are marching north because they are penned in with the Atlantic on one side and the Tagus on the other, and it's essential that they defeat Wellesley or they're going to find themselves in a really sticky situation from which there is no real escape. Wellesley's victories to this date, Copenhagen and Rolica, had it had been commendable, but not particularly impressive. And the first indication we have that, that this man is, is, is something quite extraordinary, that we're now dealing with, with a, 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 a British general who has got the, the beating of the French, is at Viniero. And this is the first time we actually see Wellesley adopt a classic reverse circle position. 
Wellesley had ensured that the British troops were in possession of the higher ground, and it was up the steep slopes outside Vermeil that the French had to make their attacks. Each time they ran into withering British infantry fire. One of the questions that is frequently asked is why did the French persist in attacking British lines in column? And, and, and what that means is a, is a column is a great battering ram of men. A typical column is perhaps 40 men wide and 60 deep, and it's a solid formation, and it's just a solid brick of men. And the British line is too deep, the Portuguese also adopted a too deep line. Now what that means is, is that, you know, 40 by 60 men, only the guys in the front rank can use their muskets, 40 muskets and a few guys down, down the side files. Whereas everybody in the British line, five, six, seven hundred men can use their muskets. And it's obvious that the British line is going to collapse the column with sheer firepower, so why did they do it? I think the real answer is it's the only formation the French know that will break through enemy armies. And of course, they were not used to fighting British infantry, and British infantry was ideally suited to defeat the column. There is no doubt that at the time, British infantry in the hands of a fine commander such as Wellesley were superior to their French counterparts. John Mills of the Coldstream Guards writing at the time said that for 365 days in a year, a French soldier is better than a British soldier. He said our movements to theirs are like dung carts to mail coaches, but when it came to the crunch on the battlefield, we beat them every time. This was not necessarily a, a tribute to their individual qualities. It was a tribute to the, the disciplinary system which had been imposed on this army, which had actually taken this, this, this ragtag collection, often the, the, the sweepings of the, the slums of London and, and, and Manchester and, and the, the growing industrial cities. And it was this draconian disciplinary system which actually gave the British their coherence uh, under fire. Now, now individually, the, the British soldier was probably a, a worse man than, than the French soldier. He was probably less capable of, of looking after himself than the French soldier. But, but when it came to, to, to actually standing in line on a battlefield, the British soldier was more afraid of his own non-commissioned officers and his own officers than he was of the French. Private Charles O'Neill of the 28th Regiment of Foot fought at Vimeo and he later recalled the French attacks on the British lines. Their attacks were simultaneous and like that of men determined to conquer or perish. The battle raged with equal fury in all parts of the field. The possession of the road leading into the narrow was disputed with persevering resolution and especially where a strong body had been posted in the churchyard. Julian knows that the British are more probability in greater strength than he is. Nevertheless, he organizes his, his small army, only about 14,000 men, into columns, and he tries four times during that day to, to break the, the British line. His skirmishes go forward, and they're met by clouds of, of British skirmishers. When his columns finally crest the ridges and come down the reverse slope, they are met by a devastating fire of, of British lines. Benjamin Harris, a Hampshire-born private who served with the 95th Rifle Regiment, left to us one of the most lucid and personal accounts of the war to date. Here, he conveys a vivid impression of the heat of battle. I myself was soon very hotly engaged. Loading and firing away, I became enveloped in the smoke I created. Such was the cloud which hung about me from the continual fire of my comrades, the white vapour clinging to my clothes, that for a few moments I could see nothing but the red flash of my own piece. It is a great drawback of the present system of fighting, that whilst in such a state, and unless some friendly breeze clears the space around, a soldier can know no more of his position, what is about to happen in front, or what has happened even amongst his own companions, than the dead lying around. French attack had broken, French grandiers were, were falling back, and it was at this point that Wellington unleashed his cavalry. Or at least he would have unleashed his cavalry, except that the Portuguese cavalry refused to advance. The 20th Light Dragoons did go forward, 
cheering at the Portuguese as they rode towards the retreating mass of the French. And then something occurs which we're going to see again and again during the Peninsula War. French cavalry counterattack. They catch the, the 20th Light Dragoons in, in a completely disorganized and scattered state. They got overexcited with themselves and charged right into the midst of the French infantry, were cut off and were pretty badly cut up. In fact, so badly were they cut up they were forced to come back to England to recruit and will never play another part in the Peninsula War. More than 2,000 French troops have been killed, wounded or taken prisoner during the fight. Several senior officers have been wounded or captured. British casualties were far lighter, at 720 in total, but they had been shaken by the strength of the counterattack. A marvelous opportunity, hard won with many a brave man's blood, now presented itself. Wellesley knew that if he could pursue the beaten Frenchmen, their army would be completely destroyed. But Sir Harry Barard and Sir Hugh Dalrymple, two elderly commanders that had been sent to supersede Wellesley, refused to order the British advance. Consequently, the British army, which had committed only half its total strength to the Battle of Vimano, stood champing at the bit, but forbidden to move forward by the new, less than dynamic British commanders. Wellesley was barely able to contain his disgust. Well, gentlemen, he told his subordinate officers, since there is no fighting to be done, we may as well go and shoot red-legged snipe. It was a sure sign of the total disarray in the French army that only two days later, General Junot sent a delegation under a flag of truce to negotiate terms for an armistice. He had little choice. He commanded a beaten army, trapped in Portugal with only the prospect of a long and hazardous retreat into Spain as an alternative. Juno knew it, and so did Wellesley. But sadly for the British, Barard and Dalrymple did not. Barard was firmly from the old school and decided that no further action was necessary, and rather than follow up and smash the French infantry, he thought it was time to conclude an armistice and so we get on to the very contentious and controversial Convention of Sintra. The Convention of Sintra was very much an 18th century document. These were armies that, that they played by rules which were well understood. Uh, and so under the terms of the Convention of Sintra, that the French were allowed to evacuate through Lisbon in, in British ships, taking with them all their loot. Uh, and this was the, the part of the of the convention which actually stuck in the in the crawl, not, not just of the of the Portuguese, but, but of the of the British public. The convention of Sintra certainly did not go down well with the British troops. Rifleman William Green could barely conceal his anger. The French army marched down to the harbour with bands playing, colours flying, bayonets fixed and with all the honours of war. Although the Convention of Sintra rid Portugal of the French at the stroke of a pen, the agreement caused public outrage at home. Such was the furore that all three commanders, Barard, Dalrymple and Wellesley, were recalled and invited to explain themselves. As a result, Barard and Dalrymple were shunted off into the backwaters of military life, and Wellesley, while being cleared of all blame, returned to his political career. Command of the British Army in the peninsula was left in the hands of the experienced Sir John Moore. Sir John Moore is the sort of last hero of the early 19th century, a soldier's soldier. He, he began his career, in fact, in the American Revolution. He was present in an extraordinary battle called Penobscot Bay, where 300 British troops, he was a lieutenant there, de defeated an army of 10,000 sent by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But of course what really made him famous was training the light division. He's renowned for his work in the training of light infantry which he carried out down at Shorncliffe in Kent and really laid the foundations for Robert Crawford's light brigade and his light division. 
his reformations in terms of the interior economy and discipline of the British Army still exists and it's, he's done legendary work, very caring soldier, in many ways a softer approach to everything than Sir Arthur Wellesley ever did. Nor was a man of the Enlightenment, and nor actually believed that, that human beings were perfectible. And, and he had this, this grand idea that, that the British soldier taken from, from very, very unpromising material could actually be perfected. He, he could be trained, he could be educated, and this could be done by, by appealing to the man's sense of honor, to his, his better feelings. And, and that became the, the basis of Moore's system of training. Fine soldier though he was, the task ahead for Moore was a difficult one. His orders simply called for him to take his men into Spain, where he was to defeat Napoleon's armies and push them out of the country. To help him achieve this, Moore was ordered to cooperate with the many Spanish hunters that had sprung up in defense of their country. Under these difficult circumstances, and with no overall plan agreed with his Spanish allies, Moore began his march from Lisbon on the 26th of October, 1808. The government ordered him to put his troops on ships, to sail them up the coast to La Coruña, to the province of Galicia in the northwest of Spain, to concentrate his forces and wait to see what happened. Moore, however, would have none of this. He was itching for glory. He didn't want to take his, his troops on a long diversion to the north. Instead of obeying orders from London, he marched directly for the heart of Spain. So John Moore's plan when he left Lisbon was to march into Spain from Portugal, marching north of Madrid in the direction of Burgos. Now by doing that, of course, he was threatening French communication with France. He hoped that by doing this, the French would march north from Madrid to tackle him that would give the people of Madrid time to defend themselves and get themselves into some sort of order. There has been no reconnaissance of, of, of the routes. Uh, intelligence is, is extremely faulty. Uh, his artillery, his cavalry and his infantry have to advance on, on separate routes. Uh, Moore thus takes enormous risk. He violates one of the, the fundamental principles of war, separating his forces in this way. Nevertheless, he is lucky and, and eventually manages to assemble his forces in the general area of, of Salamanca. With all the difficulties ranged before him, probably the last news that Sir John Moore wanted to hear was that Napoleon had decided to take personal command of the French armies in Spain. He arrived in Spain on the 4th of November 1808 with his best marshals, including Ney and Soult, and lost little time in making his presence felt. Within ten days, French forces were at Valladolid, having swept all Spanish resistance away as they raced towards Madrid. The cliché, of course, is that Napoleon was worth 40,000 men on the battlefield. Uh, the minute a Napoleon was, was in a theatre, morale just soared, and, and Napoleon was like a tonic to the French armies. But additionally, and even more importantly, was, was the fact that Napoleon imposed command and control on, on these, these feuding marshals, these, these feuding generals who had been messing up this campaign. Now Napoleon was there, things were going to happen. While Napoleon was making these rapid gains, Sir John Moore had arrived at Salamanca. The march had been exhausting, as Rifleman Harris remembered. Our marches were long and fatiguing. I do not know how many miles we traversed, but some of my companions said that we had come 500 miles since leaving Lisbon. After bidding adieu to Portugal forever, having fought and conquered, we felt elated. Spain was before us, and every man in the rifle seemed anxious to get a rap at the French again. On and on we toiled until we reached Salamanca. It was not until the end of the month that Moore learned of the extent of Napoleon's victories. The Spanish forces had, for the most part, crumbled before the French army, and no help could be expected from them. Their sufferings had been terrible. Many Spanish
Afghan soldiers had been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, whilst the remainder were starving and disease ridden. Madrid had not yet fallen, and in the hope of reviving Spanish resistance, Moore resolved to advance on Napoleon's communications at Old Castile. It was on Christmas Eve that Moore finally learned of his perilous situation, and only then by way of a captured dispatch. Madrid had fallen anyway, and Napoleon's imperial army had braved the deep snows of the Guadarrama Pass and was heading directly for Moore's army. He was outnumbered by nearly three to one. The situation that Moore found himself in at the end of 1808 was just about as perilous as any British commander has ever been in. If he were to try and fight it out with the French, advance deeper into Spain, uh, he was almost certainly going to, to lose his army. And this, after all, was the only expeditionary force that Britain had at the time. There were really only two lines of retreat. One was to the southwest, towards Lisbon, but he had a very good idea that the French were already athwart that line of retreat, and that he probably wouldn't make it. The other was safer, but, but much more perilous, because we were taking over the Galician Mountains in, in the depths of winter, and this was to retreat to the northwest, uh, towards Corona. The only option really was to march north back to Vigo, and to Corona, where he'd already deposited vaults of supplies along the route, and, and hope for the best. It was simple as that. He really didn't have many options as the uh, campaign began to cave on him at a very, very quick rate. So began a momentous episode in British military history, when Sir John Moore ordered the retreat to Corona in the northwest of Spain. Conditions of the march, a combination of freezing weather, the mountainous terrain, atrocious roads, led to an epic ordeal for the British Army, which it nearly did not survive. When War gives his orders to his army to, to begin the retreat on Christmas Day, uh, their mood is, is resentful, the mood is sullen. Uh, as far as they're concerned, they've got the beating of the French. They have advanced into Spain, they want to have that battle of the French. Now they're going to have to turn around and run away. The army was not well fed. The commissariat was virtually non-existent within a few days of the retreat. The terrain, certainly from Villafranca and Benvibre, where there'd been massive outrages, wine stocks had been looted, drunkenness, hundreds of prisoners taken by the French. But from there, right the way to Lugo, is tremendous mountains, the Galician Mountains, goat tracks, narrow paths and roads. We must imagine them at the, at the beginning of winter. The wind is coming from, from the northwest. There is fog and mist are over the mountains. It is raining more or less incessantly. The, the road is, has turned to, to a muddy stream. It, it sucks away at their legs. Men lose their boots. The, the Spanish villagers that they meet are on, on the route are hostile in the extreme. Here were the British running away, the British who, who came to help them. Uh, and they jeer, uh, they throw things at the British, and, and the British reciprocate. There's widespread looting, there's rape, there's some cases of murder. And Moore has to break his resolutions to clamp down in, in, in a, a traditional draconian way. The army at that time was famed for its iron discipline, and harsh punishment was meted out to those who fell out of line. But Moore's army was inexperienced, with fewer than half of the 35 battalions of infantry having had any real battle experience. What these men went through would have tested an army of veterans, let alone the relatively raw soldiers who struggled to escape Napoleon. The shadow of the lash hung over all those who erred. One brigade commander, General Robert Crawford, known as Black Bob, was a notorious disciplinarian who was determined not to allow order to break down despite the shocking weather conditions and hardships faced by the men. Rifleman Harris tells of how he had men flogged, one receiving 300 lashes as his wife watched on. Men 
Many who read this may suppose this punishment to be cruel and unnecessary, given the dreadful and harassing circumstances of the retreat. But I, who was there, and a common soldier of the regiment to which these men belonged, said it was quite necessary. No man but one fond of stuff like General Crawford could have saved the brigade from perishing altogether, and if he flogged two, he saved more from death by his management. I detest the sight of the lash, but I am quite convinced the British Army can never go without it. These events taught us the necessity of such measures. The stories of that retreat, I mean, the women, the soldiers' women falling out and, and freezing to death beside the road, and, and the French always coming on, and behind them this thin line of green jackets and red coats who somehow hold them off and hold them off and hold them off. And, and of course, there's the wonderful story of, the, of the, the red coats getting into this town, which is full of booze, and they all get drunk as lords. And the officers next morning going around trying to get them on their feet. Some officers are probably drunk as well. And, kicking them, booting them, getting them up, stumbling on, stumbling on. And so, of course, they finally get to Corona and turn around and inflict this huge defeat on, on the French. But it's, it's, not a, it's not a glorious moment of British history, even though we try to celebrate it as like another Dunkirk. The Moors, frozen, exhausted army ever reached Corona at all was thanks in great part to the brave rearguard actions fought by the Light Brigade under Brigadier General Crawford and Major General Paget. They heroically beat off all attempts by the French to destroy the rear positions of the British force. Without them, many more would have died on the terrible retreat to Corona. Moore and his troops finally arrived at the port of Corona on the 11th of January 1809 with French forces in hot pursuit. Moore now hoped to find that ships, which had been ordered up from Vigo, were waiting in the harbour to evacuate his battered troops. They were not there. But now, fortune took a hand. Napoleon had by now returned to France, as a fresh crisis threatened his position in Central Europe. The job of finishing off what Napoleon considered an already beaten British army, he left to Marshal Soult. But after arriving at Corona, the French commander chose not to order an immediate attack. Instead, he spent nearly two days deploying his troops, and while he did so, the British ships arrived. Moore used the unexpected respite to begin a steady evacuation of the army back to Britain. Despite the conditions on the retreat to Corona, which were terrible, British soldiers retreating, very few of them with shoes, their feet are bleeding, they're in a right state. But they were galvanised very quickly at the prospect of an action at the gates of Corona. The March to La Coruña was just as exhausting for the French as it was for the British. When Soult's forces arrived in La Coruña, they too were very tired. They were in no fit state for a fight. And so, in consequence, there was a delay of several days. It gives more enough time to, to organize his, his rear guard into, into defensive positions and begin the, the embarkation. In fact, at, at one point in the morning of the 16th of January, Moore is becoming overconfident. And he actually says, with an earshot of, of a number of his officers, uh, a few more hours and we shall be away. At that point, Salt attacks. It was not until the 16th of January, two days after his arrival, that Soult's 20,000 Frenchmen began their attack on the British positions. The Battle of Corona was finally underway. Soult believed that, that he could actually drive right through the, the British lines and, and into Corona and, and take the town. His first attack was actually stopped by intense British fire. As so he goes left flank him, he moves off to the west, and he runs into two reserve divisions under General Edward Patrick. 
and, and the shock of this is so great that the French begin to retire. And so, and so instead of the, the British fighting a, a, a defensive battle to hold Corona, suddenly the French are retreating. The main action ebbed and flowed around the village of Elvinia, which was taken, retaken, taken again, and then retaken by Moore's troops. And of course it was during one of these actions where he was bringing forward the guards and the Highlanders that he was struck by a cannonball which lifted him out of the saddle and gave him a mortal wound in his shoulder. As the Battle of Corona raged, Sir John Moore was, as usual, at the forefront of the action, riding to every British position on the battlefield, directing the battle and encouraging his men. This was, however, to be Sir John Moore's last battle. Charles O'Neill remembered the scene as he received his mortal wound. Sir John Moore, who was earnestly watching the result of the battle in the village of Alvinia, received his death wound. A spent cannibal struck him on his breast. The shock threw him from his horse with violence, but he rose again in sitting posture. His countenance unchanged, and betraying no signs of pain, then was seen the dreadful nature of his hurt. His shoulder was shattered to pieces. The arm was hanging by a piece of skin. The ribs over the heart were broken and bared of flesh, and the muscle of the breast was torn into long strips. Moore was lifted from the saddle by a cannonball that shattered his shoulder and exposed all of his chest, and those around him who saw it thought it wasn't anything particularly bad at the time. But when they actually saw what happened to him, and saw the gaping wound in his side, they knew that that was pretty much it for Moore. But as he was carried off, he had the satisfaction of knowing that his troops swept the French out of Elvinia at all various points and were driven back. And this would allow the British troops long enough to get away. The battle for Cremona gave the British an enough time to actually complete their evacuation. But we have to remember that the evacuation would not have been successful if it had not been for the fact that, that the Spanish continued to hold the town. And it wasn't until the last British transports had, had pulled out of the harbour, carrying the, the 19,000 remnants of, of, of Moore's army, that the Spanish actually surrendered. On the face of it, Corona appeared to be a disaster for the British. 6,000 men and a vast quantity of equipment had been lost, and Moore's battered army had been chased out of Spain. Naturally, the politicians did their best to deflect all blame from the government to the military, and onto Moore in particular, although they had to tread carefully. Moore was a popular figure among the public, and he had died a hero's death on the battlefield. In many ways, he was made a scapegoat. But that was largely for political reasons. He had been a very stiff opponent of the government. He had his supporters, the opposition. His reputation recovered fairly quickly, much due to the efforts of his brother, who began to write a history of the campaign. So, you know, even today, we, we revere the memory of Sir John Moore. By retreating to the coast, he pulled large numbers of French forces away from their central objectives. He prevented an immediate march on Lisbon. He prevented an immediate march on Seville. It gave the Spaniards the time that they needed to pick up the pieces after Napoleon's great victories in November and December 1808. The impact of, of, of Corona was profound right throughout the, 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 the British political establishment because 19,000 men returned in the late winter of 1809 and they were in a dreadful state. They were ill, they were emaciated, that they were dressed in rags. This is what continental warfare is like without an ally. This is what happens when you take chances. This is what happens when you don't take war seriously. And, and you get a, a real shift in, in emphasis after this. That Britain realises, after the return of the remnants of Moore's army, that it is actually in what is going to be called 
total war. The retreat to Corona and the miraculous escape of the British army had a significance that no one then could foresee. Although French armies were rampant across Spain, the Spanish people were still resisting fiercely, nowhere more so than in the blood-soaked streets of Saragossa. And the British had saved themselves to fight again. They would return under the commander who had already defeated the French twice in battle, Sir Arthur Wellesley. By early 1809, the simple French plan to occupy Portugal and so pressure Britain into making peace had gone horribly wrong. French troops had been evicted from Portugal thanks to Rolica of Vimiero and the shameful convention of Sintra, but the British were far from secure in Lisbon. The British field army had already been expelled from the peninsula once, and despite Sir John Moore's stubborn victory at Corona, there was no real reason to believe that the Redcoats would not be driven out of the peninsula again. Los Ingleses por mar, the Portuguese said. The English are for the sea. Well, they weren't. The British will turn their lodgment at Lisbon into an unassailable fortress, but while they're doing that, the Spanish are engaged in a ghastly guerrilla war that will kill hundreds of thousands. And that war reached its most terrible depths at the city of Saragossa. That tale is a savage epic, but it must wait for our next episode. Charts Walk continues at the same time, 9 o'clock, next Saturday evening. After the break, two waves of armies sweep towards the Holy Land in a surge of religious fervor as we begin the spectacular recreation of the medieval crusades.